Well, good afternoon, uh, everyone, and welcome to the Atlanta Council, including those watching online. Uh, this event is on China's influence activities, implications for the U.S. Taiwan relationship. I'm Barry Pavel. I'm a senior vice president here and the director of the Scowcroft Center uh, for Strategy and Security. And let me start by welcoming our distinguished guest at today's event, Legislator Bikam Shaw. Thank you for coming all this way from, the, from Taiwan's legislative yuan. We're delighted to have Ms. Xiao here today for what is a, a, t a very timely discussion on recent cross-strait developments, uh, especially under some increasing pressure uh, in various forms from China, which the panel will get into, um, uh, and, and uh, how a lot of these pressures have been shaping and responding to U.S. policies, Taiwan policies, and the Taiwan U.S. relationship as we mark the 40th anniversary of the Taiwan Relations Act this week, as everybody in this room probably knows very well. But in recent months, we've seen the, uh, China use increased economic pressure, political pressure, uh, in some ways military pressure, to try to influence this, uh, our, our valuable relationship. Yet it remains very much in the U.S. interest to help, to help the Taiwanese government defend itself, defend its democracy from Chinese interference. And at the Atlanta Council, we've been working with a range of governments uh, trying to uh, strengthen our approaches to uh, securing our democracy. Just last week, we had a, a, all of the NATO foreign ministers at a major event here in Washington that was called NATO Engages. If you see the hashtag, it, it broke a few records. And this is certainly in the same vein of uh, the body of work that we engaged in last week with NATO. Here in the Scowcroft Center, we work to honor General Scowcroft's legacy of service and to embody his ethos of nonpartisan commitment to the cause of security, support for U.S. leadership in cooperation with our allies and partners, and dedication to the mentorship of the next generation of leaders. And so in keeping with this mission, we've closely watched the changing strategic context shaping the U.S.-Taiwan relationship for many years, including through our cross-strait seminar series, which we proudly conduct with the support of the Taipei Economic and Cultural Representative Office here in Washington, D.C. Recently, the Atlantic Council released uh, a new Declaration of Principles for Freedom, Prosperity, and Peace with the goal of rallying the democratic world on behalf of the values that we all share among the relationships that I've already cited. This effort was led by former U.S. Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, former National Security Advisor Stephen Hadley, former Prime Minister of Sweden Carl Bildt, and former Foreign Minister of Japan Yuriko Kawaguchi, uh, who have been leading a task force of former high-level officials from nearly 20 leading democracies around the world. The release of the, de of the declaration at Munich marked the beginning of a dynamic campaign aimed at defending democracy and reaffirming support for core principles those principles include freedom, democracy, peace and security, free markets and equal opportunity, an open and healthy planet, the right of assistance, and collective action. And I strongly uh, commend your reading those, uh, reading the Declaration of Principles. You can find them on our website. And we also encourage all of you to sign up uh, if you endorse these principles. Uh, and there's a place on our website where you can sign up as well. Uh, the Council is engaging members of Congress and parliamentarians around the world, as well as civic and private sector leaders, students, and individual citizens to endorse the declaration. Uh, and you'll see more from, a, from us on social media around this effort quite shortly. We certainly very much welcome Taiwan's engagement on this, and we're very pleased to invite Ms. Xiao to participate as we move forward to implement this campaign over the weeks, uh, the weeks ahead. Today's event will include keynote remarks and a dynamic panel discussion. But before we get started, I'd like to remind everyone that this event will be webcast live, is being webcast live, and on the record. And you can, we really encourage you to join the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag ACAsia and at the account uh, at AC Scowcroft. With that, I'd like to introduce Her Excellency B. Kim Sho. Ms. Sho served as a legislator from the DPP in Taiwan's uh, legislative yuan. She was elected for the first time in 2001 and has served in several sessions 
Since then, many, many career highlights, including chairperson of the Taiwan-U.S. Interparliamentary uh, Amity Association, uh, deputy executive of the New Frontier Foundation, chief of the DPP's Department of Internal Affairs, director of the Taiwan Foundation for Democracy, advisor in the office of the president, and many other uh, positions. She was born in Kobe, Japan, grew up in Taiwan before attending school here in the U.S. at uh, getting her B.A. from Oberlin College and her M.A. from Columbia University. Uh, please, everyone, join me in welcoming Ms. Shaw to the stage for her keynote remarks. Ms. Shaw. Um, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. Um, although it's the time of the day where jet lag uh, puts me in a state where I'm not most articulate, but still I really cherish this opportunity because it's an extremely timely topic um, and it is a new and growing threat which impacts the survival of Taiwan's democracy. Um, Chinese sovereignty claims over Taiwan uh, have been made loud and clear for decades since the end of the World War II. The difference today is that their claim is not only backed by a willingness to use traditional military force, but the application of far more sophisticated and complex tactics aimed at manipulating our society and political order. Now with these tactics, which we generally call influence operations, they're clearly attempting to mold a society which favors and supports those sovereignty claims, making it increasingly likely that they could achieve their strategic goals without the actual deployment of firepower. The international discourse about China's role in the world since the end of Deng Xiaoping uh, spearheaded China's opening and reform has been primarily aligned encouraging uh, engagement and with the dominant argument that more economic, social, and political engagement with China would make China look more like the rest of the world. But instead of making China open and democratic as many Western democracies had assumed, today we are facing a China that is far more autocratic and aggressive than before. In other words, instead of making China look more like the rest of us, Today, China is exerting more influence on our societies, infiltrating and influencing our societies in a way that could potentially threaten our democratic identities. There is evidence that Chinese influence operations are pervasive in many countries around the world, such as in, Aus in Australia, where multifaceted influences are described in detailed research in a recent book, The Silent Invasion. It is certainly becoming a problem here in the United States as well. But in Taiwan, such influence operations began long before and in much, a much more intensified and sophisticated manner. There is no doubt that Taiwan faces the brunt of such operations, which are made easier through language and cultural similarities. Now in the following, I will describe five categories of tactics that China is known to use in influencing Taiwan's society. The first category is through the traditional media. Current Taiwan laws forbid Chinese ownership of TV media and news outlets in Taiwan. However, there are obvious ways by which China has circumvented those regulations. The most obvious one being media ownership by Taiwan citizens with close economic interests to Beijing. Through such ownership, news content is distorted, fake, one-sided, and at times obviously propagating a single politician or political position designated by Beijing. Fake news content ranges from military matters to even the prices of agricultural products, driving discontent and divisions in our society and discrediting the government. Fake news has that spiraled out of control led to the tragic loss of a senior Taiwanese diplomat in Osaka last year. It was also around that time that targeted propaganda with majority news content focusing on the life of a single politician had an important role in upsetting Kaohsiung mayoral campaign whose outcome was originally project predicted to favor the other side. Now, news channels that obviously favor Beijing's viewpoints are gaining prevalence, with shops and small restaurants locking their TV screens to these channels. The Fair Trade Commission in Taiwan has launched an investigation 
in the allegations that shop owners receive a monthly payment to air only designated TV news stations. Now, of course, not all news outlets are manipulated to such an extreme, but there is an increasingly alarming number of media outlets that are not as critical as Beijing as before, with an interest to market or sell their content in China. Self-censorship in the form of restricted criticism of the Beijing government has, sil has been silently influencing public minds over the course of the past few years. The second category of influence is through the social uh, networking platforms. Uh, these new social media platforms have become a convenient tool for mobilizing and propagating fake and distorted news content. Platforms accelerate the spread of disinformation across our society. These fake accounts also registered to certain platforms spread robotically also play an active role in shaping and molding public opinion in Taiwan. A legislative colleague of mine had 1.3 million negative content uh, comments on her Facebook within a week. Um, I don't think even Lady Gaga would get so many comments on her Facebook. So this demonstrates the extremity of the aggressiveness of China trying to influence public opinion uh, in Taiwan. Now the greatest irony of social networking platforms is what had been intended as enabling more openness and connectedness is now being weaponized loaded with distorted, fake, and harmful information, misleading and polarizing our society. Much of the information had been sourced in Chinese content farms, that's what we call them, but lately there have also been acquisitions, recruitments, and payments to popular Taiwanese bloggers and fan page managers to produce information favorable to Beijing. Now the third category of influence uh, comes in our local community organization. Now Beijing has delegated responsibilities to local governments in China to aggressively engage and influence local government and community organizations inside Taiwan. Religious organizations and grassroots community groups that are targeted by counterparts in China are invited to visit under an innocuous cloak of exchanges or tourism with majority expenses paid, allowed for influence networks to be established throughout our society. My own constituency or district of Hualien County has been the target of Guangxi province in China, where counterpart government agencies have established contacts and networks in grassroots wards, schools, farmers associations, religious organizations, family clans, and even indigenous tribes. The fourth category of influence is in economic dependency. Now, three decades of economic interaction with China has put Taiwan in a position of tremendous economic dependency and thus vulnerability. In previous elections, the Beijing government effectively mobilized Taiwanese businesses in China to endorse political positions and supported designated campaigns. Now in the past three years though, Beijing has targeted tourism and agriculture as vulnerable sectors in Taiwan where they can manipulate the monetary flow, disrupt normal market functions, and thus generate economic discontent within Taiwan. Manipulation of the number of Chinese tourists impacts hotels, restaurants, buses, and souvenir shops by producing a business model of dependency and leverage control by China. Another targeted sector, as I mentioned, is agriculture. And although accounting for only a minor portion of Taiwan's employment population and GDP, agriculture as relevant to consumer food prices and farmers' income has gained public attention. China is currently Taiwan's largest agriculture export market, consuming 23% of our exports, but only about 2% in our overall agriculture production value. The Chinese have skillfully used extravagant MOUs for procuring agricultural products to create the public impression of contributing to bettering the livelihood of rural Taiwanese. 
Some purchases are backed by Chinese government subsidies as political gestures and favors to some local KMT politicians. Like tourism, agriculture has become a sector where normal market economics are disrupted by heavy political intervention from China. The fifth category of influence is on political parties and campaign financing. Now, I didn't come here to badmouth the other political parties in Taiwan, but I want to share my concern and alarm that the main opposition party leadership has become a willing and eager player in supporting China's influence activities in Taiwan. On a daily basis, we are politically assaulted by prominent opposition party figures propagating Beijing's perspectives. In the past few days, they even took things to the extent of legitimizing Chinese military provocations. Instead of condemning the PLA for their fighter jets intruding on our side of the Taiwan Strait, the KMT leader Wu Duanyi demanded the Thai government must treat, Thai, treat China peacefully. That is, a KMT legislative candidate, Xie Longjie, even defended the PLA by saying the PLA was simply exercising the freedom of navigation. Now, China has obviously achieved a degree of influence within the KMT party as reflected in the party's public policy statements. Now, it would be a very rare occasion in Taiwan to hear a KMT leader or candidate actually criticizing Chinese threats. Now, we can expect the Chinese to try to exert aggressive influence in the upcoming elections. Current laws in Taiwan on political parties and campaign financing actually forbid candidates from receiving any contributions from China or other foreign entities. However, like in the media sector, the Chinese monetary flow easily circumvents regulations by coming in the form of donations by Taiwanese businesses and individuals who are willing or pressured to act as agents of the Beijing government. Now, after identifying these five categories of Chinese influence activities, the question is, what are we going to do about it, and what can we do about it? Um, I want to say first is that we need tools and regulations to combat information technology abuses. The openness of our media and social networking environment provides a vast space for abuse and manipulation. We have initiated discussions on legislative measures to strengthen the regulatory environment, but such initiatives are facing tremendous resistance by the platform providers we intend to regulate. Now, freedom of speech is a core value. Thus, in our domestic debate over legislation and regulation, one of the key questions is who is to determine what news is fake and what information is considered harmful? Does the government determine that? Do the courts have to determine that? Or should the platform providers also shoulder that responsibility? Now, there is a dilemma in Taiwan that we don't face alone. And that's why we ask that as a bottom line, multinational social networking platforms must at a minimum provide the same protections against privacy violations, fake news, trolls, and election manipulation to the people of Taiwan that they provide to other open democracies. I note that Mark Zuckerberg recently conceded the need for governments around the world to come up with standards and regulations. And this is a change in attitude uh, from the previous resistance that we got from the company, Facebook. Um, Facebook has started to work with some governments around the world to make political advertising more transparent. They've done this in the US, the UK, India, and Brazil to restrict, they've also tried to restrict foreign entities from purchasing paid political advertising during elections, which is what they did in Thailand in the recent elections. They have removed accounts found to be conducting quote-unquote, coordinated, inauthentic behavior in the Philippines recently. Unfortunately, despite my constant appeals, they are doing none of the above in Taiwan. As lawmakers, I think we need a dialogue with the U.S. Congress, our counterparts here, over legislative 
over what we can do in terms of legislation in line with common international standards for regulation that prevents abuses of fr free speech as much as it protects free speech. The second area where I think we need more cooperation is on uh, political warfare. We need next generation political warfare. I think current circumstances warrants a renewed effort at political warfare in our Taiwan-US security and defense cooperation. We need to upgrade capabilities to defend against weaponized disinformation, and we need to work together on that. The reality is that we have become more vulnerable than ever to attacks on our societies that are systematic, complex, and pervasive. While, while the US has put the idea of political warfare to rest long before the end of the Cold War, today our national security institutions need to put political warfare back on the agenda in our bilateral security cooperation with upgraded capabilities to cope with the new challenges of widespread political infiltration. The third area where work has to be done is in civilian defense. I think we need to work together between Taiwan and the US to develop civilian defense mechanisms that would foster public immunity against the virus of belligerent influence operations. Some actions are already being taken in Taiwan, initiated in the private sector, for example, Software has been developed to automatically identify fake news in chat groups and provide fact-checking and verification responses. Some NGOs in Taiwan are organizing media literacy education campaigns and grassroots training to help our population distinguish between information and disinformation. Student groups are organizing awareness campaigns against watching news stations that are becoming one-sided mouthpieces of the Beijing government and some private bloggers who refuse to be bought have also been exp exposing China's Chinese agents' attempts at recruitment. So there's more public awareness about this issue. And I note that the State Department has set up, here in the United States, has set up the Global Engagement Center, which in its official introduction leverages data science, cutting edge advertising technologies, and top talent from the private sector. Since global partner engagement is one of its core missions, I want to suggest that we set up a bilateral Taiwan-US special task force or working group within this framework of engagement involving both government agencies and private sector talent to strengthen our own civilian defenses. I think a fourth area of further cooperation that's needed in what we need to do is on bilateral trade. Since Taiwan's economy is heavily dependent on trade and exports, enhancing bilateral trade with the United States has been a major fo policy focus in our overall strategy of diversification and balance. To decrease our, vu our vulnerabilities that arise from over-dependency on China. Taiwan faces trade marginalization as other regional trade partners are engaged in multilateral free trade regimes which exclude Taiwan. Customs and tariff arrangements put Taiwan at a disadvantage as we face more regional competition. Though Japan has publicly stated its support for Taiwan's participation in a future round of CPTPP negotiations, the attitudes of some other members remain dubious. We therefore wish to pursue a bilateral trade arrangement with the United States that will help support a more diversified, balanced trade environment for Taiwan's long-term economic survival. Now final, in final and in summary, to resist Chinese influence activities, Taiwan needs to be politically and economically strong. At a time when we are commemorating 40 years of the Taiwan Relations Act and the strong partnership between Taiwan and the United States, I believe there are areas deserving of stronger cooperation. But now we have to look at this cooperation seriously, not only because Taiwan needs US support, but also because we are operating in a context where the world's strategic balance and post-Cold War order has shifted. Although the United States remains far ahead of any other military in superiority, 
the reality today is that the U.S. is losing its advantage in global influence. And in fact, the U.S. shares some of the same weaknesses that Taiwan has in light of China's effective influence operations in Taiwan and elsewhere in the world. Taiwan's strategic goal is the survival of our democratic system and our freedoms. And a strong Taiwan-U.S. partnership supports Taiwan's strategic goal as much as it also supports America's. Now I'll stop there with my comments and I'll welcome further discussion on the influence activities of China in Taiwan and elsewhere. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, thank you all for joining us. My name is Ash Jane. I'm a senior fellow here at the Atlantic Council uh, with the Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security. I'm also leading the Democratic Order Initiative uh, that Barry talked about uh, earlier on. Uh, what I'd like to do is start by introducing our panelists um, and ask them to say a few words, uh, and then we'll turn quickly to, so, to Q&A so that we can hear um, your questions and begin a dialogue. Uh, so in addition to Ms. Xiao, uh, we have to my left Michael Mazza, a visiting fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, he focuses on U.S. defense policy in the U.S. Pacific region, uh, in the Asia Pacific region, as well as Chinese military modernization uh, and cross uh, Taiwan Strait uh, relations. And then to his left, uh, we are joined by Ian Easton, who is a research, research fellow at the Project 2049 Institute and author of The Chinese Invasion Threat. Uh, Taiwan's Defense and American Strategy in Asia. Uh, Mr. Easton also worked uh, as a China analyst at the Center for Naval Analysis and lived in Taipei for several years. Um, so Ms. Chow has just shared some very insightful comments uh, and remarks on U.S.-Taiwan relations, but also on uh, raising serious concerns about China's influence operations uh, uh, in Taiwan and its efforts to try to control a narrative uh, and influence the people. Um, I'd like to start by asking our guests uh, to react to what you've heard uh, and widen the lens a little bit because uh, certainly the kinds of issues that Ms. Xiao talked about are part of a broader campaign that China seems to be engaging in the region uh, directed in part at Taiwan. Uh, so if I could maybe start with Mr. Maza uh, with some comments uh, and your reaction to what you've heard so far. Sure. Uh, uh, thank you very much for the inter introduction, and, and thanks for, for having me here today. Um, I found Legislator Xiao's remarks deeply troubling. Um, I, was, I was in Taipei in January looking at this specific question, um, and what you described was actually worse than what, what I was hearing in, mm -hmm. in some respects. So um, it was useful to hear, but dispiriting. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what, I, what I thought I'd do is sort of put this into a larger context, talk a little bit about the various ways in which China has been increasing the pressure on Taiwan um, over the past three years uh, and how that's playing into cross-strait relations and, and how the United States is responding, in particular on the congressional side. And I'll run through this, this fairly quickly. Um, but really, since, since Tsai Ing-wen was elected, uh, not since her inauguration, but since, she, since the election, um, China has imposed uh, what we could call a, a pressure campaign on the island. It's been multifaceted. It's used a variety of tools to increase pressure on the island in order to uh, weaken, isolate, and, and intimidate Taiwan and its people and to try to deprive them of any hope of a future free of unification and free from subjugation to the Chinese Communist Party. Um, as I say, Beijing has applied pressure on multiple fronts. So sort of in the traditional diplomatic sphere, we've seen the end of the so-called diplomatic truce. Uh, I believe four of Taiwan's diplomatic allies have switched sides since, uh, since 2016. Um, five, if you include Gambia, which broke relations in 2013 but didn't establish relations with the PRC until after President Tsai's election. Um, Beijing has similarly sought to keep Taiwan out of um, international organizations to keep Taiwan from, from participating as a, a mere observer in the assemblies of the World Health Organization, um, the International Civil, Civil Aviation Organization, and, and Interpol. Um, at times, Chinese attempts to 
deny Taiwan um, or ensure that Taiwan is not accorded nationhood have looked rather petty. I have in mind here its campaign to force multinational corporations, notably airlines, from listing Taiwan as an independent uh, country on their, their websites. Um, the, the pressure cam campaign has, of course, had a military component as well. I think now a um, what seems to be a sort of an already forgotten incident, at least forgotten here, was that in January 2018, China unilaterally announced new civilian flight paths over the Taiwan Strait in contravention of a 2015 agreement with the Mon government not to do so. And those responsible for ensuring Taiwan security are concerned that uh, PLA pilots and or aircraft may take advantage of these new routes to practice approaching the island under the guise of, of commercial airliners. If you look at where these uh, new routes were instituted, they align conveniently or not, or coincidentally or not, with uh, potential invasion routes. Um, and of course, there's been PLA military operations. I imagine Ian may talk a bit about this, but the latest, of course, was the uh, crossing of the median line just a week ago. On the economic front, uh, China has reduced tourism, as we heard. Um, it's destroyed food products that have not been labeled uh, made in Taiwan area or made in Taiwan area, comma, China. Um, and it sought, sought to weaken Taiwanese society. So aside from the influence operations, um, it's also imposed, again, about a year ago, uh, what it calls the 31 measures, incent incentives intended to attract Taiwanese businesses and, and Taiwanese people to, to study and um, to work and live, raise families in the mainland um, in an attempt to uh, bring about unification on its terms, um, but also perhaps to accelerate a, a potential brain drain ar ar away from Taiwan. Now, Taiwan has responded to all of these things in, in various ways. Um, to defend against the weaponization of economic leverage, Taiwan sought to diversify its its economic partner, so that's been a key driver behind the new southbound policy. It's also a reason why a bilateral free trade agreement is such a priority for the Tsai government. Um, the, the government has responded to the 31 measures with four directions and eight strategies, like sort of counter, um, uh, counter initiative aimed at keeping Taiwan's people in Taiwan. Um, uh, Taiwan's countering Chinese efforts to interfere in elections, as, as we just heard about. I don't need to discuss that at greater length. And then in the military sphere, we've just seen the request for new F-16s, uh, uh, which are needed to recapitalize an aging air force. Uh, but we've also seen the Ministry of National Defense embrace the um, overall defense concept, which we haven't heard much publicly about, uh, but seems to be uh, a concept which embraces asymmetric means uh, in the event of an invasion. How is the United States responding to all this? Um, the Trump administration is quite friendly towards Taiwan, uh, but I think Congress, as it has in the past, is really driving progress on the relationship at this point. Um, and just a couple of weeks ago, we had uh, Senator Cotton, um, in, in cooperation with a number of uh, colleagues from both sides of the aisle, introduced the, the Taiwan Assurance Act, uh, which I think is, is quite promising. Um, there's sort of the normal non-binding language about regular arms sales, um, about uh, uh, deepening economic ties, but there's some important binding language as well. Um, in particular, binding language mandates that the defense atta attache at AIT in Taipei be a general or a flag officer, and requires the Secretary of Defense to make efforts to include Taiwanese forces in bilateral or multilateral exercises. This is a step beyond the previous sense of uh, sense of Congress language in encouraging the Secretary of Defense to look for those efforts or those those opportunities. Um, importantly, uh, the act also, if it's passed, would require the executive branch to submit a report to Congress um, um, sharing the report the results of a of a review on the State Department's guidelines, its Taiwan guidelines, um, which which uh, set the rules for how our, our countries can rea can uh, interact with each other. Um, the act in particular encourages, but again doesn't mandate, the State Department guidelines be crafted with the intent to deepen and expand U.S.-Taiwan relations in accord with the reality that Taiwan is governed by a representative democratic government and that Taiwan is a free and open society that res respects universal human rights and democratic values. Um, taken together with other pieces of legislation we've seen over the past few years, so a number of NDAAs, the Taiwan Travel Act, 
um, the Asia Reassurance Initiative Act, um, uh, a piece of legislation that, that Senator Rubio introduced earlier this year on countering influence operations. All of these things, again, taken together, I think have striven to put the U.S.-Taiwan relationship on a firmer footing and, and, and move it um, into a more, uh, shift it into a more normal relationship. I'll stop there. Great, thank you. Uh, let me turn now to Mr. Easton. Um, could you provide your insights into the kinds of uh, challenges that you've just heard expressed, um, and in particular, uh, your sense of, of what the U.S. could do in response uh, to this kind of pressure campaign uh, to help Taiwan? Absolutely. Well, first of all, very good afternoon to you all, and thank you for having me here, and thank you, Legislator Shao, for your remarks, which were incredibly sobering and something that I think Americans need to hear more of. Because in many ways, we have been dealing with cross-strait relations in a wildly optimistic fashion. We were convinced in 2008, I think as a nation, as a foreign policy elite here in, in Washington, D.C., people that worked on these issues were convinced that as long as the KMT came into office and they embraced conciliatory policies towards China, that everything would work out just fine. And then in 2016, and of course they didn't, that the pressure just continued to build throughout the, the Ma Ying-jeou administration. The PLA continued to deploy missiles across from Taiwan, advance the lethality of its forces across uh, the Taiwan Strait, continue its amphibious uh, invasion uh, operational planning and its preparations for that mission, uh, and continuing to uh, really do everything in its power to subvert uh, Taiwan's governance and its, its uh, sovereignty through uh, agents of influence uh, that you mentioned, through uh, buying off certain politicians, through infiltrating spies into Taiwan. And the number of espionage cases from that time until now is, is really remarkable. And so this idea that as long as Taiwan embraced a conciliatory policy, things would be okay, has proven false. Then there was an idea in 2016, when the DPP came back into power, that as long as they embraced a very cautious cross-strait policy that Beijing would respond to President Tsai and the DPP's, their goodwill, because of course President Tsai has really taken the DPP to the limits of what is possible in terms of China policy through a lot of cautious uh, uh, rhetorical uh, measures, for example, in her inaugural speech, really trying to show goodwill to the other side uh, really trying to stay low key and stay out of trouble with Beijing. And what has the reward been? It has been what you described, mm -hmm. that Taiwan's democracy now is at a graver place in terms of the danger is graver than it has been uh, in a very long time. And the intimidation campaign has continued to ratchet up, that China continues to attempt to provoke tensions across the, the Taiwan Strait. Just to give you a few examples, in late 2017, the political counselor at the PRC Embassy here in Washington at a public event attended widely by Taiwanese media said, the day that the U.S. Navy docks a ship in Kaohsiung is the day that we invade Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Not long after, last spring, during the U.S.-Taiwan military-to-military dialogue known as the Monterey Talks, that same week, and this is, I believe, April or May of last year, the Chinese military took the trouble of building a mock Taiwanese village outside of Nanjing, a mock village. And just so no one could mistake that, that firing range, because they ended up conducting live fire military exercises there and blowing up buildings, just so nobody could mistake it, they had a giant banner on state media that said Zhonghua Telecom, Taiwan's national telecommunications carrier. So everybody would know that they are killing, in effect, this is not a military base because the, the Chinese Communist Party, the PLA, they have military mock-ups in China, that very realistic mock-ups of the presidential office, of uh, Air Force bases in Taiwan that they do live fire exercises on. This was a village. So they were, in effect, killing the Taiwanese people in effigy. They were showing the PLA going into a civilian, uh, in the mm. civilian infrastructure, houses and businesses, 
and, and blowing stuff up. And doing this at, at a very, what they must have considered a very sensitive time because you had a, a high ranking military delegation uh, here in Washington, D.C. Around that same time, this is again, is last spring, they had a live fire military exercise in the South China Sea, and they started to leak the idea that, that China's aircraft carrier, the, the, the Aoning Hao, was going to transit the Taiwan Strait on its way back to its home, home port, and that they were going to conduct very large scale amphibious uh, exercises directly across from Taiwan, uh, literally dozens of miles uh, just across from Taiwanese territory, and in some cases, just a few miles away from Taiwan's outer islands, because of course Taiwan uh, still administers and occupies islands right off uh, the Chinese coast. And what they did is they created this, this sense that this big exercise was about to occur. They invited Taiwanese reporters to go and to see this exercise, and in the end, what happened? They flew a few helicopters out, they shot a couple targets, and then they did a coastal artillery <coughs> exercise, and that was it. It turned out to be a farce. It turned out to be just an act of, of psychological or, as you said, political warfare. And so this is the type of behavior we're, we're seeing more and more and more of. And so the question is, to what end? What is Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party, what is their objective? What is their strategy? Why are they doing this? Why is it that despite the goodwill that, that both KMT and DPP administrations have shown them in their cross-strait policies, that they continue to ratchet up the pressure on Taiwan? Why is it that even though the United States has continued to adhere itself to a very binding and in many ways very contradictory one China policy out of deference to Beijing's preferences, that the United States is doing this and that the United States government will fire government employees if they go too far on, on recognizing Taiwan's flag or referring to Taiwanese government officials by their proper names, and yet the, the pressure campaign continues. Well, I would argue the reason is pretty simple. It's because Xi Jinping and the, Commun the Chinese Communist Party, their objective is not to maintain the status quo, and it's not to maintain peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait. Their objective is to annex Taiwan. And annexing Taiwan first requires exactly, legislator, what, what you describe. It describes this long drawn out war of nerves, this, this fake information, disinformation, psychological warfare, political warfare, espionage, uh, covert actions. Because this is essentially what is happening, not just in Taiwan, but across the, the Taiwanese diaspora around the world. Wherever you have a Taiwanese community, anywhere in the world, you will have agents of the Chinese Communist Party attempting to infiltrate and undermine what they're doing because they're obsessed by this mission. It is the number one external driver for the Chinese Communist Party. And, and if you read the uh, Department of Defense uh, or the Defense Intelligence Agency uh, reporting to Congress that comes out on, on this issue, it's clear that the reason China's building up its military is for this mission. This is what is driving China's military buildup. This is the number one driver by far. This is also what drives Chinese intelligence. It, what, this is what drives Chinese economic warfare because, Mike, you talked about the 31 incentives. What, what is, at the end of the day, what is the 31 incentives that Xi Jinping announced? What is that all about? That is essentially about hollowing out uh, Taiwan, undermining Taiwan's long-term economic uh, vitality making sure that Taiwan does not have a, a sustainable economy, going after the ICT industry, going after the chip uh, industry in Taiwan, poaching Taiwanese talent, stealing Taiwanese IP, taking all the best and the brightest out of Taiwan and putting them in, into China under Chinese influence so that, that Taiwan doesn't have a bright future and it becomes more and more and more independent as time goes on. Now this is not unique to Taiwan. We're seeing this with corporations uh, and organizations like universities and uh, media outlets, Hollywood uh, in the United States case, but also the Mando Pop industry uh, in Taiwan. We're seeing this around the world, but I think because Taiwan is on the front lines of the free world struggle with this type of authoritarian influence, uh, it's the most uh, intense uh, location for it. And so uh, what should we do? I think going forward, uh, first we need to have 
more talks like the talk that you just gave. We need much more public education. When we're, when we're in an environment that is increasingly defined by self-censorship and fear, we need to shine some sunlight on that because that's the best disinfectant. The more our publics are aware of what's going on, the more information that's available to them, the more difficult these types of operations uh, will be uh, to, to the Chinese Communist Party. And so I, I applaud uh, your effort and what you're doing and wish you all the best of success uh, on your visit. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much for your comments. Um, I actually wanted to pick up on the point you raised about Chinese strategic intentions. Um, and, and, and I'd like to pose, before we open up, a question to Legislator Xiao uh, regarding this question of what, a, what, the, what are the Chinese intending strategically to accomplish with the kinds of influence activities that you described. In fact, the way you described them, it, it's very much parallel to what we're hearing, what we've seen the Russians um, engaging with you know, in Europe and in the United States. And, and um, to hear that kind of uh, direct intervention into the political affairs of Taiwan um, you know, is, is very much parallel. Uh, where is this headed in terms of Chinese strategic intentions? And then secondly, when we talk about the U.S. response uh, and the, really the response of the outside world uh, in terms of countering Chinese influence, um, what are the vehicles by which we could make real the kinds of suggestions you've put on the table? Um, there's been the announced, U what's called the U.S. and Taiwan calls the Indo-Pacific Governance Consultation mm -hmm. uh, just last month that is aimed at starting a dialogue and a regional and multilateral dialogue on some of these issues. And so is that the, uh, is that the right mechanism? Can that be made more real? I'm just looking for your thoughts on that. Um, in terms of strategic intentions, I think, well, first, the strategic intention over Taiwan is basically their sovereignty claim. And they are trying to back up the threat to use military force by using other um, political infiltration tools uh, to change the hearts and minds of the people of Taiwan in favor of supporting a Beijing perspective. So that intention is very clear. In terms of countries outside of Taiwan, you know, what they're doing in the US, in Australia, in Europe, in Southeast Asia, you know, obviously it's a competition of influence. You know, it's a, an attempt to change the current world order, uh, the post-Cold War world order in which the US had a dominant influence on, a, on the global stage. The Chinese are obviously not satisfied with that sense of the world order. And as I mentioned, I don't think anyone doubts um, the US has a strong lead still in military superiority. But in actual political influence around the world, China is a strong competitor of the United States. And I'm not talking about just you know, Djibouti or Sri Lanka. I'm talking about countries in the Western Hemisphere, like El Salvador. I'm talking about your allies, like Australia, New Zealand, where China has a growing influence uh, in terms of molding the policies of these countries uh, on a global level. And, and I think, strategically speaking, um, you know, having a certain global position that matches the US power and influence around the world is, is the direction they're going. Um, in terms of other infrastructure and architecture in, in dealing with these problems, um, I think Taiwan currently, you know, we have very strong bilateral relations with the United States. And uh, we are having multiple level discussions on the various challenges that we are facing. Um, but what's lacking is a multilateral architecture to deal with this. And the reality is that Taiwan is excluded from most of the multilateral um, architecture around the world that's designed to deal with all kinds of security threats. You know, we are in APEC and in the World Trade Organizations, but these are primarily economically focused. We don't have a security architecture in which Taiwan can contribute or benefit from, and, and I think it would be useful for us to explore various possibilities, um, if not on a governmental level, at least on a track and a half or other initiatives. So um, the Indo-Pacific um, democratic um, governance consultation is certainly one useful initiative. What Atlantic Council is doing here is important. And what some other governments have initiated, like the Indian uh, Ricina Dialogue and others, uh, also provide useful um, platforms, at least for initiating multilateral discussion on these issues. 
Great. And uh, Mike, if I could ask you about the Taiwan Assurance Act, you mentioned the various aspects of the act and what uh, what the, the U.S. Congress really could put into law that might help reassure and provide that kind of support. Um, do you see that as most of the measures you referenced are sense of the Congress resolutions? Uh, is that enough, or are there more, are there stronger legislative efforts required uh, to count, counter the kinds of activities that uh, Legislator Shaw was talking about? Yeah. Um, Good, no, good question. So I think what we're seeing is over time, again, if you look at the NDAA starting maybe in 2016 or 2017 um, and the subsequent le pieces of legislation that I've, that I've um, mentioned, so the ARIA, the Asia Reassurance Initiative Act, Taiwan Travel Act, and now the Taiwan Assurance Act, which again, I'm, I'm not sure what the future of this piece of legislation will be, but we're very gradually, and I think gradually is okay, we're very gradually moving from an emphasis on the sense of language, uh, sense of Congress language, to greater emphasis on on mandated uh, changes, right? And and uh, this is slow and I think frustrating for some of us who have been you know pushing for a more forward leaning position. Um, if you look again at what the Taiwan Assurance Act says about military exercises, it doesn't say it doesn't mandate that um, Taiwan be included, um, but it also doesn't. It's not sense of Congress language that Taiwan should be included, it mandates the Secretary of Defense to look for opportunities to include Taiwan. So is that sufficient? No, um, but it's, it's progress. Uh, you know, these, these things are, are negotiated on a, a bilateral basis. Everybody has to be comfortable with them, and I'll, I'll take progress over, over, over nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, what else do we want to see? Um, I, you know, ideally, we don't need to mandate Taiwan's inclusion in at least bilateral exercises. That, to me, seems valuable and something that's that's doable and I hesitate to uh, you know sort of deprive the executive branch of their prerogative and deciding who we exercise with but it's something we want to see happen so I think it's, it's something for Congress to keep looking at as time goes by um, in a, a NDAA last year the year before Congress mandated that the Secretary of Defense um, provide a a report to any arms sales request, and I think it was a six-month time period. We need to match that uh, with with uh, legislation requiring a similar response from the State Department. Um, again, ideally, the uh, executive branch would would be regularizing arms sales on their own, and they are, um, it, or at least they appear to be. We'll see about these F-16s, um, uh, but it's it's not necessarily the case that a future administration will do so. So I mean that that's one key and relatively easy thing, non-controversial, uh, that we could get, get done. It doesn't require arms sales happen. It requires that we give Taiwan an answer, essentially. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I do want to get to questions, uh, but just very briefly, um, Ian, you talked about this, that, that China's ultimate intention is annexation, is ultimately seeking to uh, you know, push the envelope. Is that something, would you describe that as something new, or has, it, has essentially that's been uh, the goal from Beijing for years, uh, you know, or is there something new about the way they're orienting their ambitions today that's different? I think it's, well, I think both are true. So it's not new. As soon as Chiang Kai-shek moved his emergency government to Taipei in December of 1949, the PLA started to prepare for an invasion of Taiwan to end the uh, end of the Chinese Civil War. What has changed, though, is the ambition as China, Chinese power has grown, and as the Chinese Communist Party has become a more deeply authoritarian, it's always been very troubled, and it's always been very authoritarian, but we have not seen a dictatorship the way we see now under Xi Jinping. We've not seen concentration camps where literally millions of people are having their lives shattered, uh, and that, that's going on today. We have not seen that level uh, of tyranny in China. We've seen an authoritarian uh, mm -hmm. China, but we've not seen that, that type of tyranny. And I think that's what's changed, is that Xi Jinping's leadership and the way that uh, China's government has evolved over the past five or six years is deeply disturbing. And that is having very real implications, not only for the United States and Taiwan, but for countries around the world. And I think our, our lack of speed in terms of reaction, I, I agree 100% with Mike that sometimes reacting to these things gradually is, is a good thing, that you don't want to overreact, 
But I think by reacting as gradually as we have, uh, as governments, as, as democratic governments, this has encouraged Xi Jinping, perhaps, uh, and his advisors to think that what they're doing is working, that more and more people in Taiwan, for example, are convinced that they're in a hopeless situation, that they've lost hope for their future, that they think that they, they are truly isolated and no one's going to come to their rescue and there's nothing that they can do about this situation and so they have to capitulate. And I think that that goes on in the hearts and minds of, of politicians and leaders at, at all levels of society, from the media to the, the fishery organizations you talked about, to religious organizations, to tourist companies, that one by one these individuals clearly have, have come to the conclusion that they're in a hopeless situation. And so they have no choice but to surrender sovereignty over their specific organization. A and that's why Chinese influence continues to spread uh, in Taiwan. And of course, the same thing is happening in our own society. And, I, and again, I think that's being driven by a very ambitious and very aggressive uh, leadership in Beijing. Can I just add uh, uh, one thing? Sure, there? briefly, yeah. So, you know, we, we've long seen that or said that the, the Chinese Communist Party's number one goal is to, to maintain its leadership. Now we also can say, I think, that Xi Jinping's number one goal is to maintain his leadership, right? He's essentially made himself president for life if he, if he wants it. Translation, um, dictator. Right. Um, so how does he do so? He's made a lot of promises of, of economic prosperity to come by mid-century, which are increasingly difficult, I think, to, um, to deliver on, given the economic headwinds facing China. And so he looks to external problems that he, he thinks he may be able to fix. And the most important one of those for him is, is Taiwan. Great. All right, let me uh, turn to the audience then uh, for Q&A. Um, I saw a couple of hands up. Let me start with Harlan uh, from the Atlantic Council. Uh, I'm Harlan Ullman. Uh, that was an interesting conversation. And I can remember the number of times I've been visiting China when I would say, please stop harping on Taiwan and let's get on to something more serious. Well, so you're quite right, this is uh, visceral. Uh, but my question is, what's really new? Since 1917, the Soviet Union tried exactly what you're saying in different ways. Uh, after World War II, the CIA, with some success and failures, tried to do the same thing. And the problem is much broader. Uh, Rupert Murdoch, about whom you may have heard, in Australia, the UK, and the United States, through virtue of his huge media and television controls, hired and fired prime ministers, and Fox, I think, has helped to elect Donald Trump. So what you're saying is just not state basis, it's also on a non-state basis. And it seems to me, from the position of Beijing and Moscow, this is perfectly rational. Why would you expect them not to do exactly what they're doing? They have tremendous inroads, they're playing against freedom of speech, and it's a good way to exercise great leverage and control. And I would suspect that this is going to get worse before it gets better. And we may have very few ways of countering this, because the irony is the more we try to counter, the more we limit free speech and all the attributes of a free society. So my question is, this is a Chinese water torture. How long can Taiwan endure this? Because quite frankly, despite the resolutions of Congress, unless the United States was prepared to say, we had to go to over war, we would go to war over this. It seems to me over the long term, unless there's great patience in Taiwan, uh, China is in a very, very strong position over the next 10 or 15 years to achieve its end. So before we get to an end, I want to take one more question just to bunch them together. I think the gentleman in the back there with the, with the glasses. Um, yes, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, Rick Fisher, uh, IASC. Uh, B. Kim uh, and Ian, Mike, excellent uh, points. Uh, and uh, just, just following on, uh, on Harlan's comments, uh, uh, it appears every day we wake up and uh, it's simply being further and further confirmed that uh, we are in a, a, a full-fledged cold to soon to lead to hot war at various points in the globe with China. Uh, the last cold, hot war with the Soviet Union only ended with the end of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. And uh, that can be attributed to uh, you know, one third government effort, one third uh, chance, the election of, of, a, of a good leader, and uh, then the collapse of, of that party from within. Uh, is, it, 
is it time now to take the lesson of the Cold War and sort of jump to the conclusion and say, as, as much effort as, as we put into defending uh, ourselves from the, uh, the CCP's predations, we also have to invest in delegitimizing, at a minimum, delegitimizing the Chinese Communist Party and creating institutions that isolate it and separate it from the Chinese people. All right, uh, let me turn to our panel uh, for a response. Um, legislator, maybe you want to take on uh, Harlan's question on, uh, on sort of Chinese and Russia's uh, efforts as just being a natural uh, you know, extension of, of what any country with their outlook might do. Well, um, I certainly agree that China's attempting to utilize the various tools available to them um, to a maximum uh, effectiveness. And I think the question was about um, what's our endurance level and, and how far can we survive under such um, renewed or new political uh, warfare tactics and uh, attacks on our society. So, and this is why I'm very worried about our, our future and that's why I'm here sharing my concern. And uh, we, it, I, I think our endurance will depend on how quickly we can put into into work the various defense mechanisms that I mentioned earlier in my remarks, like public immunity, awareness of what China's doing, you know, kind of a more optimistic expectation of the better judgment of our population, um, their skepticism of what's happening, or, you know, in the worst case scenario, they're kind of blinded by the various um, psychological tactics that China is spreading in our society. So, um, you know, a, a lot has to be done, and it has to be done urgently. And, and um, I, I can only say that. And, you know, we, 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 we need to, you know, the tactics are intensifying in the level of uh, pervasiveness and in the um, diversity of their tactics within our society. They're going deep into our society. I mean, in the previous elections, they tried to influence our elections. They started out by just, you know, announcing military threats and firing missiles in, in 96. But now they're deep positioning themselves deep in our society. And, 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 and we need those social defense mechanisms. We need a public immunity campaign, uh, media literacy, um, public awareness campaigns, et cetera. And, and, and this is a global effort, I think. It's not only a Taiwanese effort. And that's why we need these international efforts to, to deal with the problem together. Uh, let me take uh, some more questions here and bunch them together uh, before we turn to our other panelists. Uh, yes, right over here, please. Thank you. This is Steve with Formosan Association for Public Affairs. And we start to hear some politicians in Taiwan portraying Taiwan as a victim of U.S.-China tension and that Taiwan should stay neutral because you and myself, United States might sell Taiwan like a product on the shelf. What's your response to that? Thank you. Uh, on the end here, yeah. Uh, Richard Coleman, CVP, retired. Um, to what extent do you think the 2020 election in Taiwan will be an actual plebiscite on choosing between the relationships of the United States and strengthening that versus China? And, and will the Kuomintang be blatant in, in in making that distinction, or do you think it'll still be uh, written, you know, between the lines? And a question here at the end. Uh, Peter Humphrey, Intel analyst and a former diplomat. I'm following on this other question. Why aren't we making a massive investment in uh, information operations to break the Great Firewall? It seems like the party is profoundly vulnerable, and I see nothing in the way of a campaign to uh, deliver information by stratospheric drones, by satellites, by messages in a bottle, by 100 more radio stations, just nothing. And here's our opportunity to actually end the party and therefore end the problems. Uh, let me have our panelists respond. Uh, who, anyone want to jump in with the questions that are on sure. the table? Yeah. Just to the, the initial observations and questions that were asked, so your point is spot on. We're dealing with a Leninist political organization. The Chinese Communist Party is, is Leninist. And any Leninist political organization, by its very nature, is militaristic. So if you read Chinese, go to the People's Daily. 
or the, the PLA daily, read the outcomes of any Politburo Standing Committee meeting. These are civilian politicians. In our system, they would be politicians. They talk to each other and they talk about what they're doing as if it's a, a war campaign. Everything is, is a campaign, everything is a brigade, everything is mobilized, everything. It's, it's just a fundamental part of their fabric as a political organization is it has this militant nature. It has this deep-seated paranoia, this deep-seated sense of crisis that there's always a crisis. And indeed, within an organization like that, you always will have a crisis. I mean, Xi Jinping has purged over 100 general officers at the core level or above in the last five years. He has purged the Chinese equivalent of the, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who's now dead, and the Chinese equivalent of the Deputy Secretary of Defense. Now, can you imagine? Uh, we've never experienced, and thank God, we've never experienced anything even remotely similar to that in our country. And so you can imagine this constant sense of crisis that they have. You can also imagine that a political organization such as theirs, by its very nature, is then going to be expansionistic and predatory, and that's exactly what they are. And so, Rick, to your point about what we can do to delegitimize what is, of course, an illegitimate political organization that rules through misinformation, through fear, and through the rule of a small minority elite that controls, I mean, because essentially what you have is 80 to 90 uh, members of the Chinese Communist Party controlling, and I mean really controlling in a totalitarian fashion, increasingly so with, with uh, mass surveillance and all the other tools that they have of social control manipulation. You have this small group controlling 1.3, 1.4 billion people in China. It is a, a Chinese version of apartheid. So this is an illegitimate government at its core and so what can we do as democracies to highlight that? And I think with every election that Taiwan has, there is no greater, there's no greater method in the world today to delegitimize the Chinese government than the example that Taiwan's government sets for the entire Chinese speaking world uh, and for democracies elsewhere. And so the more the United States can do to treat Taiwan like a valuable, respected, and legitimate diplomatic partner, political, economic, militarily. The more we can do to improve our relationship, the more we will be doing to undermine the interests of this deeply authoritarian regime in Beijing. Mike, did you want to jump yeah, in? Yeah, sure. So uh, also just on this question about it, isn't this what the CCP has always done? Yes. I mean, I, look, I think there's been a couple things that are different now. Um, one is social media makes this job a lot easier than it used to be. Two, in the, in the case of uh, China and Taiwan, uh, the resources which China now has at its disposal um, comparatively are just enormous, right? So it can just throw a lot more at this problem if it wants to. Um, third, I think there has been a step, in, because those things have enabled to step up, you know, them to step up the intensity here, but I think one of the reasons we've seen them do so um, and I'd like to get your take on whether this is accurate, is because you know, I think th that the CCP was enormously frustrated that um, the Ma years didn't bring unification any closer to reality. They thought, essentially, we can buy off the Taiwan, Taiwan society, and they'll, they'll accept that unification is inevitable. And in fact, what happened was you know, familiarity bred contempt. Right? There was a backlash, and people in Taiwan said this is too much, too far, too quick. Um, and so there was a recognition that um, Taiwanese people valued their independence, and, and China needed to do more to, to shape society in a sort of more sophisticated, less blunt way. And I think that's what brought us sort of to this, this intensification. Um, just on this, this the point you made earlier about how this is sort of familiar to us, that this is what the you know, Russians did this in 2016, the Chinese are probably doing some of this as well. I think that's right, but I think we also have to be mindful of the difference in scale, right? Over 300 million people in this country, Russia can, can maybe have a marginal effect. It's 23 million people in, in Taiwan. China can sort of flood the zone, uh, if you will, in a way that 
that Russia or China, nobody else can, can do here. It's just the, the, because of the imbalance and scale, um, the potential for damage is that much worse. Legislator? Um, yeah, I think the first two questions were a bit related, and I'm going to respond by saying this, that you know the meaning of the 2020 elections. The um, South China Morning Post a couple days ago had an analysis of the 2020 elections in Taiwan, posing it as a choice between Chinese cash or American values, American democratic values. Now, I think that's a false choice. It's a false dichotomy. Um, and it's exactly what the Chinese want the Taiwanese voters to think their, their next election is, you know, to, 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 to make the choice in the next election. And I think instead of saying it's Chinese cash versus American values, uh, it should be Chinese fast cash versus sustainable economic growth based on rules-based and open society and democracy. And um, so we need to change the narrative of the choices or options available to the people of Taiwan. And we need to do that by strengthening our networks, our ties to the rest of the world. And by presenting you know, a, a, an economic future for Taiwan, essentially. Um, I think in every election, I know there was one American election campaign many years ago that said it's the economy, right? The and economy it's stupid. always the economy. Um, and, and what we're seeing in Taiwan is, you know, we have stable economic growth. You know, our e exports are okay. GDP looks okay. The problem is domestic distribution of the economic growth. And I think a lot of societies are facing that with globalization and the changing production chain around the world. And I think it's a gigantic challenge, but we need to rephrase the narrative and the choice for the people uh, of our society, and we need to do it soon because our election's coming up within a few months. We have a couple minutes left. I'll just take uh, two more questions and then we'll move on over here and then in the back. I'm Jody, I'm a deeply uh, concerned Taiwanese American. I've been traveling to Taiwan, uh, Melbourne, Australia, and uh, Spain, uh, Mel uh, Madrid to be specific. And I haven't noticed the, uh, the Chinese influence uh, against the US and uh, the Taiwan, of course. But I think all the discussion I've heard so far, I don't think uh, we have touched on China is in deep trouble too, right? I mean, it's a very influential, I've seen everywhere and everybody's seen everywhere. But how do we, particularly the US and the Taiwan, how do we emphasize our core values uh, and then contrast the Chinese government, uh, not just government's values? basically go back to that dejuvenizing de the Chinese government. For example, uh, I've seen in uh, Madrid, there's a hundred channels in the hotel room, and then there are four channels from China. And then I don't believe all the people who in Spain are gonna watch those Chinese channels because they are live broadcasting uh, the, uh, the two meetings. And I don't think any uh, Spanish people can be looking at their um, they are China and say, wait a minute, who's this country from? They are, they are China, but wait a minute, why are they doing this? It's, it's very, very uh, autocratic, and there's no democratic value in it. And I think, in a way, I think I'm trying to sum up, but I think China is their own worst enemy. And I think we need to emphasize that, and then to try to uh, delimitize the Chinese government. Okay, and uh, last question in the back, please. Uh, Herbert Regenbogen. I'm a fellow from the Catholic University of America. My focus is on security architecture, which is flawed if the military assets of an F-16 meets a China stealth fighter in the air. The only military assets to be compatible is F-35s. Basically, the security architecture is totally undefined. We're confined by the China policy of one country or one nation and two governments. This is our parameter. How do we integrate a security architecture that we don't have a direct conflict with China? Sorry, can I have, I was pointing behind you there, so I will take this one last one, go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Milo Xie, I intern at the US Taiwan Business Council. Um, I want to ask something about the bilateral trade agreement that legislator Xiao talked about. So um, in the past, the US and Taiwan has conducted talks on, on a TIFA, but one of the biggest problem is uh, U.S. import of pork into Taiwan. 
and specifically um, the chemical clenbuterol in Chinese we call that sololjing has been a problem for the Taiwanese farmers. Now agriculture has been an easy sector where Chinese disinformation have creeped into Taiwan. So I want to uh, ask how, you know, in light of um, fear-mongering, disinformation, how do we convince the people of Taiwan that, you know, to give up this protectionistic attitude and open up to trade with the U.S.? All right. Uh, we're almost out of time, but Legislator Xiao, I can give uh, the floor to you mm -hmm. to react to any of those questions we had, um, and then mm -hmm. uh, maybe we'll wrap up there. Yeah. Well, um, food safety is certainly a very important issue for the people of Taiwan, and but it's often uh, politicized as well. Um, but I want to say that um, I, I don't agree that uh, Taiwanese have a protectionist attitude over U.S. agricultural products because we are one of the top one or two uh, per capita consumers of American agricultural products as, as of today, even without a free trade agreement. Um, but I think what, what we need to present uh, to the people of Taiwan is that you know, agriculture is one aspect, but we have so many more opportunities, including Taiwan's other industry, and um, you know, in the value and the benefit of integrating further with the United States uh, economically uh, has to be a strong argument, and that has to be made. But of course, there are certain obstacles at, at, at the moment that are very difficult for us to overcome given the current political circumstances. Uh, and uh, we, we do need other projects to be more supportive of our agricultural sector so that there is enough confidence to face uh, international competition. All right. Uh, well, thanks very much, everybody, for uh, joining us. If we could uh, give a round of applause to our panelists. And uh, thanks again. For <laughs>